You see what's sending out the negative waves, did Moriarty? But Oddball, I did try and tell them, but they won't listen. I tried. Sure. But I did. I did try. <sighs> oh, man. Don't hit me with them negative waves so early in the morning. But I can't force them to listen. I can't. Always with the negative waves, Moriarty. Always with the negative waves. There you go. More negative waves. Have a little faith, baby. Have a little faith. But I keep trying. Oddball, I keep trying. But they won't listen. They won't tune in. They really won't. Why don't you knock it off with them negative waves? Why don't you dig how beautiful it is out here? Why don't you say something righteous and hopeful for a change? Tune in to Awake Radio for your positive way. I want to talk to you today about feelings. Feel, 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 feel. That's right. I want to talk to you today about feelings. 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 Feelings.
If we look closer, however, it is full of mysteries. For instance, does water have a memory? Do the molecules remember events they were once confronted with? Are cosmic forces at work? The quest for the true characteristics of water leads straight to science's front line, where fact and mystery mingle. There, where but a few steps separate misconceptions from discoveries that change the world. Everything flows, everything is composed of water. The human body, plants, animals, the larger part of the earth is covered with water. No wonder then that metaphysics and science have always been interested in it. At some point in time, water was able to leave the mystical world behind and find its way into the scientific textbooks, with which everything seemed settled until suddenly people turned up who recognized new and spectacular properties in water above all its so-called memory about which hundreds of stories are now told the idea behind it is that water is influenced by its surroundings by other materials that it comes close to and also from rays and vibrations that are capable of changing certain characteristics of the water and this in a very strange and mysterious way that to this day remains a mystery to science the most astonishing assertion comes from a japanese naturopath named masaru emoto the proof he furnishes for the memory of water is as weird as it is thrilling. He claims to have proved without a doubt that water is capable of storing information which he can also make visible with the help of photographs. The form of water's ice crystals changes according to the nature of the information with which the water is confronted. Bad conditions and disharmony, says Emoto, can lead only to ugly crystals, such as those from Tokyo tap water or the murky depths of the Ganges River. Canadian glacial water, or pure water from the Alps on the other hand, produce edifying and harmonic forms of great beauty. Masaru Emoto also plied water with music, initially solely classical, from Beethoven to Chopin. He claims that water can remember the music and that its ice crystals reflect the character of the music. As one may well expect, Emoto found that Beethoven, Chopin and Bach prompted water to produce beautiful, evenly formed crystals. Whereas modern music, most particularly heavy metal, brought forth nothing but amorphous, ugly shapes. Since one knows so little about water, many different theories exist. We are still at the very beginning and are presenting all this to scientists around the world to discuss. They may be distressed since this is a completely new way of thinking. And once they've thought about it, they might still not know what to think. And if not, simply keep quiet.
12 years of research in the ice house, tens of thousands of crystal photos, the burden of proof seems immense. Water, Emoto states, is capable of remembering events, a claim that's enough to make any physicist's hair stand on end. For water has already presented us with a wealth of miracles, within the framework of the laws of physics too. Most substances stretch when they grow warm, and when they get colder they shrink. Not so with water, which is at its densest or heaviest, at four degrees plus and not at zero degrees centigrade. Thus in winter, the coldest water is on the surface, and for this reason a lake will freeze downwards and not the other way around. When water freezes and becomes ice, it also becomes, as opposed to all other fluids, less dense. It expands and floats to the surface. Were this not the case, our world would look entirely different. There would be no floating icebergs and ice cubes would sink to the bottom of our drinks. The cause of all the magical suppositions lies in the molecules. Although water is composed of two gases, oxygen and hydrogen, it does not, as is the case in many similar combinations, remain gas, but becomes a fluid. The explanation is that single water molecules join other water molecules and together they form larger, short-lived structures and thus become fluent. This phenomenon is generally considered a classic textbook example, although no one has ever actually seen the heaps of molecules. These appear to form and then dissolve again unbelievably quickly and seem also to invest the water with a kind of temporary order, the so-called memory that can store information. Water that stores information. A hypothesis with which one particularly and very seriously concerns oneself in Russia. Hidden away for decades behind the Iron Curtain of the Soviet Union, researchers were protected from the shifting fashions of science and this had the advantage of allowing them to approach a host of subjects without inhibitions. Yuri Rachmanin is considered the top authority on water research in Russia. He is vice president of the Academy for Natural Sciences. For him, the prime obligation of a researcher is always keep your eyes and your ears wide open. Несомненно, к нам обращаются очень многие Many people come to us who work with water and search for unusual qualities in it. Often their ideas are quite absurd and so we refuse to entertain them. But some of their findings are corroborated by chemical and physical tests, however. And that means that we researchers must examine them, since for us, investigation is the first commandment. And a lot does get done in Russia. By Vitol Bakia, for example, who is primarily a researcher and, as a consequence, also a businessman. He owes his success to an invention which, according to the present state of science, shouldn't really exist at all. It took him 30 years to develop a machine to wholesale cereal production that will free water from bacteria and impure emissions in a matter of seconds without chemical additives. On the other, with remarkable qualities. It is biologically pure, heavy metals have been rendered harmless, and the dubious structure of the water radically altered in the process. Basically, the procedure relies on the familiar electrochemical technique of splitting the water, whereby a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, the volatile oxyhydrogen, is produced. 
What remains a mystery is just how Vitor Bakir managed to produce this particular reaction in his machine. But when all's said and done, one thing alone is important. It works. Within the uh, last uh, five years, we produced approximately 25,000 sterile devices for uh, Russian hospitals. In any hospitals in Russia, you can uh, find our sterile devices, our water purification systems, uh, for getting uh, washing disinfection and sterilizing solutions, ecologically pure washing disinfection and sterilizing solutions. It uh, can save a lot of chemical reagents, can save money, can save efforts, etc. The technical details remain a secret. At all events, the machine contains pipes made of titanium and ceramic membranes through which the water is conducted and in some way activated. What happens to normal Moscow tap water in a matter of seconds is illustrated here by a test involving a few drops of ink. On the left, plain tap water. On the right, Bakir's altered activated water. While, as might be expected, the ink colors the tap water, the activated water swallows it up completely. Much of what happens here beggars scientific explanation. No, uh, uh, there are no people who says that this is, uh, cannot work because we uh, cannot understand what is it exactly. Uh, there are no, because uh, we have effect, uh, uh, we have, uh, for example, uh, we use these solutions for health. And uh, we have a lot of uh, studies and scientific reports which uh, gives us uh, uh, answer. This solution is non-toxic and it's work. But why this is question for uh, anybody, for a big scientist? People who look on water simply as a solvent are mightily deluded. Water that falls from heaven as rain and washes the streets but does nothing else, that is simply not enough. Water is without doubt a source of energy and information. It yields hydrogen and oxygen. Here in Russia, several research projects are currently testing the possibilities of using water as a source of energy. They're even talking of constructing a water motor. A Moscow Research Institute and a further experiment in causing water to do things that are not quite in keeping with the laws of physics. One is attempting to expose oil polluted water to a beam of shortwave light and, with the help of the induced energy, separate the oil from the water in the proverbial twinkling of an eye. The method, as one will clearly see, is not quite ready for cereal production. First the water, then add a couple of drops of old oil, then a plastic bottle so the oil doesn't splash on the ceiling. It does work, even if a little uncontrolled. Seen from a chemical point of view, water molecules are quite simple and insignificant. And it is precisely this that thrills the Russian scientists. The further one looks, the more extraordinary concepts come to light. Vasily Kashirsky is a scientist and head of the mysterious Center for Physiological Security at the Institute for Strategic Research in Moscow. For many years, he has developed disks with geometric patterns that are, so he says, capable of loading cosmic energy and influencing the structure of water, and with it, its memory too. Sama forma, имеет определенный сакральный смысл. 
The pattern itself has a religious meaning. This not only leads to various energy transmissions, but also to a reassembling of the water structure. <coughs> it's safe to say that faults in the water, such as those that cause cancerous effects in the human body, for instance, are thus eradicated. Most physicists would be astounded by this. Nevertheless, it is possible to measure this phenomenon. An electric charge takes place in the water, and it comes from the cosmos, says Kashisky. So, are we dealing with physics, or magic, or alchemy? The concepts of magic or alchemy are quite relative. On closer consideration, alchemy is also chemistry. I think the closer we get to water, the more we will find out about ourselves too. Whatever there is to it, the Russians have taken up the scent and hope one day to be able to broaden the laws of physics. My views on water have changed radically, and I'm certain that everyone else will change theirs also in the very near future. In the course of our research, it has become clear that we were quite simply unable to solve many of the mysteries involved, particularly those relating to the physical aspect of water. Magic and science. One of the great achievements of the modern world was the ability to clearly separate these concepts one from the other. The Tribunal for Arbitrating Disputes is now based in London, in the editorial offices of the magazine Nature, the High Court of Natural Sciences. What Nature publishes is deemed recognized, and he who is quoted in Nature is earmarked for a brilliant career. He who is rejected, however, or exposed by editor-in-chief Philip Campbell and his jury, might just as well say goodbye to the title of scientist. The memory of water and cosmic energy are taboo in these hallowed rooms. Verdicts are reached soberly and without emotion. Whether scientists are known or unknown is irrelevant, but when a claim is unusual or extraordinary, we would take a special effort to make sure that the referees give it very careful scrutiny. And sometimes the referees have said the only way we can judge this result is for us or somebody else also to do the experiment before you decide whether to publish it. And on occasion that recently that did happen, we were We've, the referees suggested to us that we should do that, and we offered to do that with the authors, and they refused, so we didn't publish the paper. But even nature can be wrong. In the 60s, the discovery of polywater kept the world on tenterhooks. A Soviet physicist discovered that in tubes partly filled with water, another new fluid would accumulate in a matter of days. Nature duly published the news. This new water was denser and tougher than normal water and froze only at minus 30 degrees centigrade, on top of which it appeared to possess a kind of memory. A worldwide polywater hysteria broke out. A year later, the dream was at an end. The water miracle was due to nothing but pollution, which no one had noticed until then. Altogether, 400 researchers had been led up the garden path. Could anything like it ever happen again? Very hard to say because people have learnt from that and from other experiences to be very cautious. But it's not clear that what happened was bad in polywater. What happened was a scientist, as far as I'm aware, made a claim based in perfectly good faith and other scientists found it extremely interesting and made genuine claims which on the face of it were indeed interesting. What did happen I think which was perhaps questionable was that the community wasn't sufficiently critical so those claims went on for too long. Some people could have looked more carefully at what was being claimed doing particular experiments more quickly than they were done and the story could have been disproved 
scientifically. However regulated by stringent laws the structure of natural sciences may be, it is very often single persons who upset the apple cart, as in the case of a 72-year-old Tyrolean who left school at an early age, but who nevertheless is responsible for an invention that defies the laws of physics and all those who question it. The man's name is Johann Grander, and his invention is the so-called revitalized water. Here we see him being decorated by the Republic of Austria for his services to science. And prior to this, much the same honor was bestowed on him by the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences. The reason for all these honors is Grander's much disputed invention, an appliance for the production of revitalized water that he successfully exports all over the world. After many long and arid years, Grander is now gaining recognition. And should this not be a case of gigantic mass suggestion, it can only mean one thing, that it is not a swindle, and the jubilation is a perfectly legitimate accolade. What exactly do Johann Grander's water revitalizers do? They ensure, for instance, that the water in a swimming pool meets the standard hygienic requirements, even when only a part of the prescribed amount of chlorine has been dissolved in it. So, less chlorine and yet adequate antibacterial protection. We have here the Hauptwasser Leitung. Here we have the mains. The old pipe comes down here and leads to the individual taps. We interrupted the circuit here and introduced the activating unit like a bypass. The water flows in here, passes through the unit, and then re-enters the old pipe again quite normally, just as it did before. Nothing has been added, nothing taken away. What actually happens inside this box is poppycock from a scientific point of view, and it's Grander's secret anyway. The magnet holds the energy. The magnet attracts the energy and passes it on to the water. I never studied, so I always watched things and was allowed to notice it. Grander water has many different effects. Take, for instance, the Knoll Bakery in Bremen that delivers wholemeal products to 150 health food shops. According to the customers, the rolls made with Grander water stay fresh longer and are a good deal tastier, too. Nobody feels they've had the wool pulled over their eyes by a dubious invention here. I had my doubts to begin with. You can't see anything, you can't hear anything, and you can't smell anything. So, all right, we tried it out, and right away, we noticed that something had changed in the water. An improvement in various ways. One thing that is calculable in production is the relation of water to flour. Ever since revitalized water has been flowing here, more of it is used in baking. In other words, the same amount of flour as usual, but more dough. And for this reason, the bread dries out less quickly than it used to. An additional advantage for the bakery is that since it hooked up the grander appliance to its taps, it needs approximately a third less washing up liquid, quite apart from smaller, but no less welcome side effects. Mir schmeckt der Kaffee besser. The coffee tastes better to me, and that's an important point for us bakers because we work mainly at night. It's not so bitter. Revitalized water is also used in the production of synthetic fibers in factory cooling systems. The cooling must be constant, otherwise the quality suffers. Up till now, chemicals were necessary to fight slime, mold, algae, and calcium. Ever since a water revitalizer has been installed in the system, however, the cooling water has been free of algae and bacteria, and one can dispense with chemicals altogether. 
Ich war zugegebenermaßen sehr skeptisch. I'll admit that I was skeptical at first, thought the whole thing was some new age gimmick. But it was soon obvious that the quality of the cooling water was improving constantly with the new system. As a technician, I'm at a loss to explain it. Our reading showed good quality to be sure, but for the moment we can't explain why the water quality has become so consistent. When it comes to money, few firms are prepared to joke, and the Casino Austria gambling halls are no exception. And yet the branch in Felden employs a water revitalizer in its air conditioning unit. The reason being that the employees complained of dry eyes and throat inflammations. Since the cooling system has been filtered through a revitalizer, one can dispense with chemicals and no one moans about bad air anymore. As expected, it pays off. We've saved money. Our calculations tell us that we'll have recouped the grander outlay within three years. Since faith in the law generally has little chance when pitted against profit, one thing is certain. Mr. Granda's revitalized water appliances work, even if science is unable to explain why. It's a fact that shouldn't be considered reprehensible, for all the laws of physics are only models after all. As Albert Einstein once wrote, the most beautiful and deepest experience a man can have is the sense of the mysterious. It is the underlining principle of religion as well as all serious endeavor in art and science. He who never had this experience seems to me, if not dead, then at least blind. It is... Yeah. Water is intelligent. It's enormous. Much more than the air. No one has ever researched that because it's like I say. Those who have no money, or not much, they try something out. And those who have a lot of money, the scientists, they research something and it's much the same. You can only be a scientist if you act in a scientific manner. I think there are well-established ways of doing science. So even if you're questioning orthodox ideas, nevertheless you do have to do science in a way that other people can do and that does stand up to tests of the standards of measurement. So, for example, if you make a measurement, you have to report the accuracy of that measurement. And a lot of uh, reports that make outrageous claims that subsequently get discredited don't follow those rules. If you look carefully at the measurements, you find that they're making extraordinary claims for the accuracy of the measurements. So that's an indicator sometimes that there's something wrong. This man would never tolerate being accused of working unscientifically, and yet Vladimir Konstantinovich Kondratov, a doyen of Russian physicists, is the only man yet to have offered a daring explanation for the peculiar effects of Granda's water. He assumes that water possesses structures that can be altered. These structures are able to absorb the sun's energy and cosmic rays as well. When water is treated by Granda's technology, the structures get larger, they grow. And these chair-like structures also enlarge vertically. And because they enlarge, they are also able to load more energy from the sun and the cosmos. You understand, the bigger the package is, the more energy can be drawn from the sun and the cosmos and distributed to the environment. And here again, the concept cosmos enters the discussion, apparently as a synonym for the inexplicable. 
Can it be that divine providence has guided Johann Grander in hitting the bullseye and shaking the very roots of physics? For despite his modest academic prowess, he does possess some of the most important characteristics of a good physicist. He was curious and playful his whole life long. The old man and his ideas represent the no-man's land between science and pseudoscience, where so many fruitful thoughts lie buried, and at least as many illusions and wrong tracks as well. In Johann Grander's case, clues have been accumulating of late that revitalized water is more than just a creed. Indeed, there is also proof. It comes from a venerable institute in the Technical University of Graz in Austria. Here one has taken water from various sources, analyzed it according to scientific standards, and compared it to Grander's water. The results show no differences, but for one single exception, and it is absolutely sensational. The revitalization process had apparently programmed the Grander water to reduce the surface tension by up to 17% compared to all the other waters tested, regardless of temperature. The head of the institute has no doubts about the physical and chemical explanations for this phenomenon. Since publishing the study, he has been swamped with inquiries and attacked by many colleagues to boot. Ich möchte mich nur auf dieser Ebene bewegen, dass ich sagen kann, das, was für mich messbar ist. I'd like to stick to my principle that I can believe something that is measurable. I would shun everything else emphatically. I am too much of a technologist to risk my neck. Von der Wasserchemie einfach zu wenig verstehe. Many of the revitalized water's effects remain a mystery, but one will be obliged to think again. Ich muss das Kind anders nennen. I'll have to rechristen the child because suddenly I've got one water that's called water and another that's also called water and only active in parenthesis. We all know water as H2O and that's all. So it means we'll have to bring in a new concept. Basically, the idea of water having a memory has been plaguing science for centuries. Above all, with the lessons of homeopathy, which is based on the assumption that water is capable of remembering certain active agents. Homeopathic medicines are so radically diluted that taken statistically, no single dose can possibly contain a solitary active agent molecule. Nevertheless, the healing effect of the agent appears to be retained because the water remembers it. In Germany alone, some 4,000 doctors treat and heal with medicines that are produced on the strength of this memory effect, which, according to physics, shouldn't really exist. All current attempts to prove the phenomenon have ended in disaster. Scientifically, it is hard to understand, if not impossible to understand, with what we know at the moment, how something that is so dilute could possibly have any effect. And I've yet to see any suggestion that is credible and that has stood up to testing that it can work. So in that sense I'm very, very skeptical. Animals are regarded with less suspicion when it comes to pseudoscientific effects. Homeopathic medicines also work on animals, who care not a hoot about scientific disputes. Their owners, too, who pay for the treatment after all, are relatively uninfluenced. Had the treatment of their darling pets with homeopathy not worked, then that side of medicine would have gone broke long ago. The Austrian veterinary doctor Peter Knafel has specialized in homeopathy for more than 10 years, with continuing success. Many animals, already written off by their owners, recovered under his treatment. This is confirmed in countless studies, but which is redundant in practice. 
es wissenschaftlich ist oder nicht, spielt es nicht besser. I don't care whether it's scientifically proved or not. My only concern is whether it works. And day after day in my practice, I witness success. So proving homeopathy is not so important. My advice is don't believe it. Because if you look at the way water behaves and everything we know about the molecular behavior of water, it's very, very hard to see how water could have a memory without dissolved substances. So my advice is don't believe it. So how should the man in the street orientate himself in this no man's land between faith and science? Ignore everything that science considers poppycock? This would be very difficult for some. As here, for instance, in the tiny village of St. Marain in the Alps, where the bells proclaim a physical mystery. Prior to its restoration, this 900-year-old church was plagued by rising damp, so damp that the sandstone walls gradually became moldy. In fact, one could say that the walls positively soaked up the water. Today there is no longer any sign of this. Only a few years ago, Holy Mass was celebrated in 90% humidity. Now, it's as dry as a cardboard box factory. Responsible for the miracle is a nondescript appliance that works without electricity and which, according to its maker, calls on energy that finds no mention in books on physics. It's quite an absurd construction that nevertheless has undoubtedly reduced the dampness in the church by a third within the space of a few months. I'm no new age enthusiast and no physics expert either, so I'm a layman in both subjects, I'm afraid. But at all events, it's already been proved that there is much that physics and orthodox medicine have not been able to prove, and that there are more things between heaven and earth than we can weigh and measure and so determine. So I'm convinced that no one has a monopoly in this matter, that there can be various ways to approach it. Following the course of this startling invention quickly brings us to the venerable monastery at Klosterneuburg near Vienna. Here too, one had long done battle with dripping walls, most especially in one very old cellar that one wanted to convert to a vinotique. Today, the only damp thing in close to Neuburg's Vinothek is the wine. The walls are dry, and again, hanging well disguised from the ceiling, we find a mysterious device. It was much cheaper than all the other methods on offer, but was nonetheless viewed with mistrust for some time. We drilled the walls, we tested everything in the walls and so on, and it works. I'm quite convinced that it works. As a result of the success we've had here, which is palpable after all, it stood all the dampness tests, we have used the same method on three other projects, and it works there too. Apparently the device is able to manipulate the dampness so that it retreats into the earth. How does its inventor explain this phenomenon? So, das ist dieser neuartige Generatortyp. So, that's the newfangled generator type that is built into a wine barrel and protected by it. Basically, the generator type is made up of a receiving antenna that receives the ground energy. The incoming energy is then polarized, that is, it's, it's made dextrorotatory and put through the transmitting unit. 
on top of which the so-called cosmic energy flows in from above and that strengthens the whole system die sogenannte Raumenergie ein, die das ganze System in seiner Wirkung verstärkt. Science or not, Wilhelm Mohorn has already sold 26,000 appliances and points to a band of exclusively happy customers. Is there still more out there than our book learning ever dreamed of? Miraculous effects make the participants euphoric and therefore blind when it comes to objections. In such cases, it is advisable to accept defeat honorably. A practical example from Moscow. Johannes Koppensteiner, who makes international contacts for Johann Grande and his revitalized water, also loves to launch daring experiments. In his Moscow hotel room, he places two little bottles with radioactive water beside one bottle of Granda revitalized water. Will the mere vicinity of the Granda water suffice to reduce the contamination overnight? Next day, his first call is at the university. Koppensteiner is full of optimism and not without reason. A short while ago here in Moscow, scientists watched small amounts of radioactive polluted water being put through the mysterious Granda revitalizer, and it appeared that the rays had indeed been reduced. He's arrived. The Institute for Radiochemistry at the Moscow Lomonosov University. <laughs> An undertaking like this is in no way an everyday occurrence for the scientist. Koppensteiner is a layman after all, and the experiment is anything but ordinary. <laughs> Yuri Sapochnikov, head of the Venerable Institute, has left himself plenty of time and instructed several of his young students to apply themselves to the problem. When I told him about the experiments that had been carried out in other institutes, he really said, no, this is not possible. But he said, he told me, you know, I've been doing, you know, research work, you know, with radiochemistry now for almost 40 years. Uh, I have never heard, you know, that something could reduce radioactivity. So somehow, you know, I think it was, you know, the personal uh, sympathy we felt for each other. He said, you know, okay, give it a try. The result of the test is just as most physicists would have expected. No reaction. Contrary to similar tests, the radioactive rays in the bottles have not diminished. Was the test too absurd? Did Koppensteiner expect a miracle? Miracle uh, for me is something, you know, uh, that happens beyond our understanding. That doesn't mean that it's in reality a miracle. Miracles uh, always have, you know, reasons. There's always a cause for the effect. Uh, miracles are just an indication that we do not understand all. Uh, from a broader perspective, most likely, miracles are something, you know, quite normal and just belonging to some other uh, uh, laws and conditions. Some people will begin to think that our research borders on fraud, I'm afraid. But the time will soon come in which new parameters are introduced. Then everything will be in place, and scientists will be able to check our findings and also the relevant technology. Investigating the inner order of water, its memory, and the influence of the heavens, one inevitably comes across the quintessential myth, the snowflake. Do these artworks of nature store information in their bizarre forms? Do they bring messages from heaven to earth? Each year, sextillions of snowflakes fall from the clouds and each crystal is unique. For centuries, researchers and philosophers alike have been fascinated 
first to photograph snowflakes was Wilson Bentley, a farmer from Vermont. Bentley became an obsessed photographer at the end of the 19th century because, as a child, he had heard a sentence that he couldn't forget. No one snowflake is like another. The Center for Snowflake Research is today in California, of all places, at the California Institute of Technology, where there's a physicist who searches for the order that governs the wondrous forms of snowflakes. Ken Librecht is currently the sole physicist able to produce snow crystals in a laboratory. All thought of cosmic energy is scoffed at in these rooms. Ken works quite arbitrarily and always somewhat casually. Oh gosh, it, uh, it just sort of came up one day. We were talking uh, about science and things in general, having a beer, and there was some students, and it came up, and I was, uh, I was basically just interested enough to start researching it, just to, just to learn about it, and, uh, and then I got very interested in it. I found the physics was, was interesting, and uh, a lot of it was unknown, and it looked like one could uh, to learn a thing or two by doing some experiments. The snow crystals are bred in an ice box. It soon became clear that they react to the tiniest differences in temperature and to particles of dust in the air too, and that they alter their shape accordingly. Librecht won't own to having noticed any memory or cosmic influences. Thus, the old question as to whether two flakes look alike answers itself in a profane way. Well, similar shape you can find. Uh, it's sort of true that no two snow crystals that are alike, at least the complicated, the complex ones that fall out of the sky, uh, they're a little like people. They have a lot of little uh, nooks and crannies, and uh, the shape they're in depends on the path that they've chosen to fall through the sky. And no two crystals take exactly the same path, and so, uh, so no two crystals are exactly alike. They're like people. So it's that simple. But what is the solution to the great puzzle? Will the whole excitement about the memory of water turn out to be a delusion in the end? Or will the laws of physics have to be rewritten? Both supporters and adversaries alike of these daring theses profess to possess clear-cut evidence and claim to have true science on their side. One might accuse these courageous discoverers and inventors throughout the world of boundless naivety, they who are not afraid to question nature's laws. But in its infinite and glorious variety, water itself points physicists and heretics alike down a common road, a road with a signpost, never give up. I'm quite sure that we're on the right track. When I started to work with Yuri, I sensed that it was right. I'd like to add that lots of people come to us who've worked out new technologies, who busy themselves with the physical effects of water. They come to us because they're turned away by traditional science, which is often afraid of them. However, fear is something that hampers the development of science. We investigate these claims and phenomena according to strict scientific laws. If we find conformities which can be proved beyond doubt, we don't hesitate to talk about them and inform the general public. Sometimes persistence does pay off. If you have a scientific instinct, that tells you that people are ignoring something, I think it would be quite wrong for me to say they shouldn't pursue it. Because going against the common belief is a very exciting thing to do in science and can lead to dramatic new discoveries. The scientists call it H2O and that's it. That's the end of it. But there's a lot more to it than that. 
And I'm of the opinion that they should look into water more. Wake Radio. Straight talk for the awake and aware. Hello and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that pod on uh, Top Secret Water. That was a 2005 documentary, by the way. And right now I have a guest with me, and this is Chrissy McMahon. She's one of the one of the hosts here on Awake Radio. How are you doing today, Chrissy? I'm doing wonderful, Rick. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, no problem. Hey, uh, so uh, tonight we're talking about water and how water can retain memory and things like that. Uh, what all do you know about it? Some of the things that I understand about it, I learned from watching. Uh, Dr. Emoto's water experiments and uh, understanding that intention has a large impact on water and how we feel puts an imprint on the molecules of the water and then when he froze it it created ice crystals that were either beautiful <laughs> with a good intention or all distorted with a negative or dark intention. Yeah, um, about 20 years ago, uh, there was a research paper that was uh, put uh, published in uh, Nature magazine. And this French scientist, uh, Jacques uh, ben ben Bevaniste, uh, said that uh, pure water could uh, somehow remember what it had previously contained. Okay, and he started I, with a substance. I believe that. Caused, that. He started with a substance that caused an allergic reaction. He diluted it over and over until there was nothing except water. And then he observed that the pure water still managed to trigger an allergic reaction when it was added to living cells. I mean, that's that's crazy. <laughs> it really mm -hmm. is. I mean, I I had saw some other studies that uh, they had done with water on on uh, ice water on how when you speak into the glass and you you give it good kind thoughts you like you say love and compassion things like that into it and then they put it under a microscope and look at it the crystals were beautiful I mean I mean stunningly beautiful as beautiful as any snowflake you'll ever see but mm -hmm. whenever hateful words were spoke into it they were just a complete mess yeah that's uh, Dr. Emoto's uh, intention test ah, research okay. Okay, so I, I knew a little bit more than I thought I did then. <laughs> but yeah, Absolutely. I mean, I, I thought that was amazing. I really did. And right before we came on, I'm not sure if it's the same doctor you were just talking about, but I watched a little video about they put flowers in the water and then they took a drop from that water and each flower imprinted into the water and it created a an ice crystal that resembled the flower that was dipped into the water. Wow, that's amazing. I thought that was pretty beautiful. Yes, that would be. And I imagine, I mean, I'm sure that this is just stunning, these scientists and just, you know, normal people all over the planet that water is actually, has, has, has a lot to do with uh, 
the rest of the planet on how it is also, I believe, it's also a living uh, organism. Mm -hmm. I mean, considering that the planet is covered mostly with water and our bodies are mostly water. Absolutely. You know, I mean... Yeah, the, and that. not to change the subject, but it mm -hmm. also, I would imagine, apply to the ether that, that's all around us. If water has memory, then probably the ether <laughs> all around us, the air that we breathe, <laughs> right, right. the photons and everything all around us um, is alive. Right. And I it's mean, just that would, uh, amazing. That would bring forth a propagation of positive or negative energy everywhere. And in the world that we live in, it's no wonder that we live in such a chaotic world because of all the negative energy that is put out and verbally and, you know, through, through actions, you know, uh, I'm sure that, uh, an atomic explosion causes some of the most negative energy that is out there. Absolutely. I was thinking that myself, um, not too long ago. Um, I think right when you asked me to come online with you to speak about water and, um, I was, I've always wondered like what was the purpose, the ultimate purpose of all the nuclear tests and the atomic tests that they did underwater, underground, and in the air. And um, I think probably just to disrupt, you know, <laughs> whatever yeah, the space. Well, the, the very essence of life itself, yeah, definitely. I mean, whether that was their intention or not, that's definitely what happened. You know, yeah, and I think it it's everywhere. yeah, I think it's important too to say just as a as a caveat before you know we get any deeper into this. Um, it's really hard to understand um, intention, but um, I tend to believe that although we we do err on the side of fear, that if we believe something, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral, that that's the most important thing in our life and that's what we manifest so if we believe that we're not going to be uh, affected by any of these things these negative <laughs> severely negative things like t atomic blast and all this other stuff what they're doing to the food what they're doing to our water then in retrospect it seems that that would uh, be the most applicable way to look at this that well, because definitely. our intentions can create our reality, then no matter what we fear that might be happening, and I, I tend to agree with this statement that the more we focus on it, the more we create it. So if, you know, we keep focusing on FEMA, <laughs> FEMA camps, and, uh, and the, the, the depletion of food or the, you know, the, the problems that are being created through Im immunizations and all this other stuff, the more we manifest that. And then the more we talk about the loving aspects of life and ourselves, the more we'll manifest that. So I, I'm not sure I said that clearly. <laughs> well, I would definitely That's what agree I tend that, to believe. Though. I would definitely agree mm -hmm. with that. And, and it definitely has a direct correlation to what we're talking about tonight. You know, uh, Absolutely. The, the water having memory. I mean, and that, that should hold true for pretty much any natural liquid on this planet, you would think. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, talking about positive and uh, negative imagery, you know, it's not only what we say, it's, like you said, it's the intent of how we say it. And if, you know, if we say it in a negative light, it has more power than it does if we say it in a, uh, a uh, more, uh, I don't know, I, I, I guess you could say jokingly, you know, mm -hmm. it has a lot more power involved behind it. You know, the, the belief system that we live in right now is changing and people are starting to understand that our thoughts actually bring forth positive response if we Absolutely. have positive thoughts and the same holds true with negative yes mm -hmm. 
So I what agree. other kind of and, studies um, did he do? Well, with water, um, I've been involved with uh, distilled water mostly. Um, uh, I have a friend. His name's Andrew Norton Weber. He's a friend of, uh, of Dave Murphy, who's uh, also a host here mm -hmm. on Awake. And yes. the two of them have uh, done, uh, con not conventions, but have, uh, have done talks together on distilled liquids and urine therapy. And in 2010, I met Andrew, and I learned about distilled liquids, and I've been drinking distilled water ever since. Um, uh, what, what I've learned is that um, pure water, which would be um, just pure H2O without any um, minerals or chemicals or any additives in it, um, is probably the nat natural state of water. Now, I can't tell you for sure if Dr. Emoto only used distilled water when he did his test, but I know that on some of his tests, um, he did, he had used water from different sources. He used city water, he used water from a beautiful palatial uh, water setting, you know, a spring, um, you know, places that were spiritual and stuff like that. So um, he used water from all around wherever he was testing. So he, um, I'm not sure that he just used distilled water I'm not even sure that he did use distilled water, and um, so I can't really speak on that. But um, the experiment I'm doing with myself is I've uh, <laughs> this is funny. I um, I drink distilled water and I make my own because I have my own machine. But I was drinking bottled distilled water, which is not that harmful, even though it's in a plastic container. Because as Andrew says, if you buy from uh, Walmart, they have a uh, a large volume that comes in and out, uh, more people are purchasing it, so it's fresher in a sense it's not sitting in the bottle as long. Right. Um, and not to be afraid of uh, whatever the water would leach from the bottle because in retrospect, um, distilled water actually takes away all the things in your body that are inorganic. It literally leaches from your body those things that your body can't use. So and like part of the agent. reason, yeah, absolutely, that's exactly what it is. And if you understand the process of the kidneys, if, if anybody could take the time to go and Google um, the, the process of the kidneys and, and look on the nephrons, which is the filtering system, part of the filtering system of the kidneys, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of these nephrons in our kidneys that are like, they look exactly like little distillers. And it's it'll it's mind blowing when you see it for the first time because you just can't imagine <laughs> that you have this in your body and they're like microscopic. I mean, you can't really see them with the the naked eye. You have to look at them under a microscope. And, you know, the the kidneys are like I guess the size of your palm or smaller. So imagine you have a hundred and thousand of these in each kidney, and um, and they take the liquids, all the liquids through your body that make up your blood. And the fluids in your in your body system, and as it goes through your system, your heart pumps it the blood through your system, and it and it goes through the process and it comes out as waste in the bladder. Um, what you're essentially urinating out is um, a bunch of hormones, uh, minerals, amino acids, like uh, excess of things that your body just can't hold on to and when you're not drinking that distilled liquid or distilled water and you're just drinking regular tap water or god forbid drinking soda all the time or something like that um, what happens is your body has a, a greater difficulty processing all that and it tries to get rid of it and that's how we end up with all these different elements especially like arthritis and gout and all these different illnesses and disease that goes on in the body because your body tries to heal itself and it, and if you're pushing stuff that your body can't use into the system great and greater force than your body can clear it out then you're you know you're causing the the, the damage and the problems that with your health and everything and the reason why I laughed when I started saying this is because I've been drinking distilled liquid since 2010 and periodically, I'll 
I'll go through periods of eating raw or just, you know, being very minimal in, in what I consume. And then I go through these, like, binges where I'll have ice cream, mostly haagen <laughs> And I'll just eat haagen I'll go all day without eating anything. I might drink less than a gallon of water throughout the day and I'll come home. Of course, I'll, I'll have some kind of hunger. And the only thing I'll eat will be, like, ice cream. And uh, I recently had blood test done and they said I was pre-diabetic and um and she says it takes a while for it to show up in your blood system and I'm thinking well I have been eating that but not as much lately and my triglycerides were high and my cholesterol I guess was or or the HDLs I forget which number what it was 201 and 200 is supposed to be you know the the cutoff point and it was like 201 or something so they're not really concerned about it but I'm going to be tested again in three months and and what I think has happened is because of the binging I did with eating the junk food that um, my body was able to, to clear itself a lot but because it's the only thing I was putting into my system <laughs> it's, it's showing up on their tests right. as as what they're saying. So uh, I'm laughing in a sense because what they're measuring with their test isn't really helpful because all they'll want to do is give you pills or right. other stuff. It's, it's they, they don't, anyway. yeah, if you would have saw the food she, w she was going to try to talk to me about, it was all this, it looked like overcooked dead food. It was just, <laughs> and I, I, I try to encourage people not to eat cook food because I think that's where we all get this weight gain and we have problem with elimination and, and then we have the other problems with our health. You know, just go down the list and, you yes. know, I think all things are contributable as far as disease and and, uh, and illness with the body to, to what we eat, what we put into our bodies. And as you started the conversation, our thoughts and our intention and since we are they say over 70% water, you know, eat, sitting in front of a television and watching a violent show and eating food and putting that into your body, you know, you're like compounding that whole process Absolutely, of the intention. Yes. Do you know what right. I mean? I mean yes, I <laughs> so do. There's, yes. there's lots of things you can take well, I try not to watch. I try not to watch any negative programming if I can help it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I never touched soda. I've never liked soda. Something just told me years and years ago. Well, actually my dad, whenever I was a kid, my stepfather took us to a, a field that had this junk car in it. And he took a can of, of, uh, of Coke with him. And he said, he said, you don't want to keep drinking this. He said, I'm going to show you something. So he popped the lid on it and dumped it all over this this junk car that was sitting up there now the paint job was pretty decent still on the car but the car was wrecked and he said now we're gonna come back up here in a week i want you to look at it so a week later we went back up there and looked at it i mean that soda had ate through the paint and caused i mean the the metal was starting to <laughs> rust rust really bad i mean I it bet. was it was terrible i mean it, it it really had an impact on me i never drank soda after that Wow. I just never liked soda, so I was fortunate. I didn't like the bubbly. I didn't. I just never liked the way it felt. I just didn't no. do anything for me, although I do like root beer soda periodically, but more like root beer floats. And I had this really a strong attachment to Diet 7-Up when it was made with saccharin. For some uh -huh. reason, I liked that taste. But they stopped making it, so I stopped drinking it. <laughs> yeah. They make it with NutraSweet now or something, so I don't like it. Oh, my. But I liked it with the saccharin. But I didn't drink yeah. it like people do, like buy six packs. I would just, you know, get it whenever I got it. So I was fortunate that way. Yes. But um, something you were saying, like um, when you were talking about uh, the, the, the process of uh, the rusting of the, the soda and everything... I forget what I was going to say, but I, I, you know, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's just amazing. Oh, right. it was about the Coca-Cola, the color of Coca-Cola. Did 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 that ever like like tip you off to me? <laughs> Something's wrong here. 
we have water, pure water is clear, and then we have Coca Cola, which is like mud. Yeah, the color, color of mud. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's like it's so diposed to water. It's like everything in our society today, in our culture, is complete opposite from natural. Oh, and yeah. it's just um, amazing how far we have gone from what and and how opposed people are to things that are natural and healthy. Like most yes. people don't even eat vegetables, even if they're cooked, they won't that's, even eat them. Yeah, that's sad. I'd rather if if I'm going to have vegetables and they have to be cooked, they have to be steamed, and not very much. You know, just just enough to warm them up pretty much i like the crunchiness of the vegetables and stuff too you know mm-hmm. and plus you don't lose all the uh mineral and vitamin mineral content out of them whenever you just steam them lightly mm-hmm. they are very good <laughs> you know one of the things that really solidified me not drinking soda anymore was my neighbor my neighbor he was he was maybe a year younger than me but i mean he drank a two liter bottle of soda every day every day and i mean this mm. kid was bouncing off the walls i mean belligerent with his with his mom and dad i mean just uh he acted like he was spoiled is what he acted like and i know that that's not what it was you know because on the days where he would go and we would go and spend all day outside and he didn't have any soda he was he was really mellow but on the days that he had soda all day long, he was just bouncing off the walls and just totally wired. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, I don't, I do not want to be like that, you know? <laughs> no, absolutely not. And it's all that sugar, too. Well, I mean, we're going off in so many different directions. Oh, you know, <laughs> I mean, all these things are so harmful. No, they are, you know, I mean, and, and, it, and it all correlates together, you know, to to good health and to uh, being smart about your choices of what you what you uh, put in your body, what you mm-hmm. let out of your body verbally uh, through thought, um, you know, through physical action. I mean, all these things have to have to uh, come into play if we want to change the paradigm. Absolutely. You know, it's. I'm uh, trying to. I'm. <laughs> Go ahead. Now I was just trying to think. It's like I, I want to stay on the topic of water because I think that's that's what you want to talk about tonight and a, and and a lot of my understanding goes to total health and food and our relationship with food so um, I'm more first on like kind of that aspect of it mm-hmm. but um I but I, I like the idea that it's all it's all you know it's all involved it's all connected <laughs> God. have you ever heard of anyone being uh, having uh Water poisoning, water toxicity. Um, heard I've heard people saying that, but I've never, heard, I've never met or seen anybody. Well, I know a girl. That. I know a girl that lives in Western Pennsylvania, and mm. uh, she was, she's, I don't know, she was, she was overweight. I mean, she wasn't really, she wasn't really fat, but, but she was overweight, and she wanted to try to lose weight, so she started drinking water. And next thing you know, she's drinking like a gallon and a half to two gallons of water a day and not eating meals like she should have been eating meals, you know. And uh, she had water poisoning and it messed her head up. I mean, it changed but her as what a kind of What kind of water? What kind of water was she drinking? She was drinking bottled water. Just the yeah. regular well, bottled, here's- you know. Here's the problem, and I'll exp- I'll explain it as best as I can, the way it was explained to me. Um, a lot of us drink city water, and we all know it has chlorine, and it has fluoride, and it has minerals and different other things. And today, in water in a city, we also have um, the chemicals that people flush from their system or flush down the toilet. Um, there's a uh, drain cleaner, there's laundry detergents, 
you know, there's all those kind of chemicals, um, pesticides, insect repellents, whatever, right. uh, cleaning products. And there's also people, a lot of people are taking uh, antidepressants or medications like antibiotics and all that kind of stuff. And, and although a lot of things don't have a long uh, half-life, like they may not exist for a long time, when they're suspended in water, I don't know what that is, but all these things, when they're all mixed together, they probably have uh, interactions with each other too. And then we're drinking that water. That water's never purified in any way. It's just like recycled uh, that kind of doesn't take out the toxicity of that water. And as I said before, the kidneys and the liver and all the other organs of the body work double overtime every day to try to clean your system so your other organs can run efficiently, your skin, your heart, your lungs, you know, your bladder, everything, your bones, whatever, your muscles. So your body is a really efficient system. So you're drinking city water, say, you're putting all that toxicity into your body. So we might be able to say, well, she drank a lot of water and that was the problem. But I think if somebody did an analysis, you know, whether through hair or um, through the blood or whatever, the urine, however they want to test, or maybe all three, they might find out that the toxicity wasn't caused by the water itself, the H2O, but all those other things that are involved in there. Um, there's different types of water. There's spring water. There's well water. Um, there's water from the rain. And then we have city water. So just speaking about the different types of water that we would come in contact with on any you know given day, um, all those waters... Uh, including rainwater. I'm going to put rainwater in there because the natural process of rainwater is distilling. Um, you know, it's steam evaporation. It, it sucks it up into the clouds through the sun process of the heat. And um, when it does that, it's not necessarily taking the, the, the minerals and all that other stuff, putting it into the rain clouds. But because there's all the toxins and stuff in the air, it's getting absorbed back into the air through the, you know, through that process and then come and rain it back down. So the minute particles that are in the air and in the atmosphere are being absorbed into the water molecules and they attach and that's how actually snowflakes are created. A snowflake doesn't create, get created without some kind of dirt, dust or mineral, whatever you want to call it. So with that knowledge, we know that the water coming back down from the sky is not pure water in, the, in that sense. But the process that gets it up into the air is actually a distilling process. So that's, that's just one type. Um, the mineral water that you get from springs or wells, um, depending on where the water is, can have any uh, level of, of mineral content higher or lower, um, all those things uh, combine in your body and are difficult for your system to flush out. So when you're putting that into your system, your body has to work to try to clean it out so it can have good stuff to work with. Right. That um, makes sense. By drinking the distilled water, which doesn't have anything in it, I give my body that break and also have that added benefit of, of the flush. And the, be the way it works the best is to have uh, like a, a pound of water, which would be two cups, be like 16 ounces, like drink it down at one time. Like I'm not saying in one gulp, but, you know, drink it as fast as you can. And that helps push it out. And it really has an amazing effect on how how it responds with your body. And um, and if you are drinking a gallon of water plus a day, you, with that's distilled water, pure water, then you have that uh, that f effect of flushing your system. But if you're drinking city water or spring water or, or well water, 
or rainwater or anything like that, you're actually, it's like drinking Coke, you know. Well, at least Coke, you know what you're drinking <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but with the other ones, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're drinking that water, wherever that got that water from, that's well, let me what you're getting. You let me ask you this then. Okay, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, water other than distilled, drinking something other than distilled water. Now, mm -hmm. if you think that this is going to be a, a toxic uh, type of liquid, then you're going to get a toxic type of liquid, right? I mean, and that's, that's, you know, that's the intention. Mm -hmm. Right. See, see, now that's, you know, ever since I found out about water holding memory, every glass of water I get, I talk to it. I tell it, I, uh -huh. I, mean, I love you, you know, I, I, I want you to be good nourishment for my body, you know, I greatly appreciate Absolutely. what you will give me and I value it greatly. That's what I tell my water and I do it verbally. And, you know, I, 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 I don't, get any ill effects from it. I don't believe I do. But, you know, that's that's me, though. You know, I mean, a lot of people And that was say, the caveat uh, mm -hmm, that I said at the beginning. is like, what's your intention? What right. you believe? Right. It has a greater effect than any harm that might be attributed to whatever. Yeah, and, and they talk about a lot of about. things, especially uh, with the... Uh, with the uh, geoengineering that's going on right now, you know, the uh, chemtrails, if you will, that that it has uh, nanoparticles of aluminum and uh, a few other different uh, heavy metals in it that they spray out there, and it gets into everything. I mean, it the particles are so fine that. No matter what you filter it with, you're still going to get them. Now, if you believe that, that it, I think that would become detrimental. But I believe if you can, if you if you have trust in your own beliefs and believe that you can heal yourself and keep yourself clean, that that is exactly what will happen. You will keep mm -hmm. yourself healed and you will keep yourself clean. Your body will filter out all that negative garbage that goes into your system, no matter what you in, intake. I, I sure. tend to agree. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure there are some extenuating circumstances like, you know, I, I, I don't think it would be possible, but I'm not positive because I don't drink it. But I don't think that would be possible for people that drink two liter bottles or two two liter bottles of soda a day. And I know a lot of people like that, you know, and I don't understand it myself, I, you know, to, but then again, you know, it, it's made to be consumed. So I'm sure there's an addiction value that's involved with it.